Happy Easter Midway. Good to see all of you in the house. Look at this good looking group. Look at somebody real quick and just say, I like your Easter outfit. Let them know. They need to hear it. Hey, I got some good news for all of you. Whatever you came in with today, here's some good news for you. He is risen. He is alive. Give him some praise. What an amazing day. It's already been baptisms, and I'm glad you're in the house today, and I'm glad all of you are tuning in wherever you may be. He is alive, and because he lives, not only can I face tomorrow, I have a tomorrow, and I have life today and every day because he lives. I want to preach to you today for just a few minutes about the reach of the resurrection, the reach of of the resurrection. And as we talk about the reach of the resurrection, we as a church have actually been looking for about three months at the book of Acts, and we're talking about how God reaches people but uses his church to do that. And here's the message of Easter. I don't know what brought you here. Maybe somebody drug you here. Maybe you came just to get them off your back. Maybe you showed up because you're here every week. Whatever brought you here today, maybe you came in with what we call the church smile. Y'all know about the church smile? Here's mine. It's the one, it doesn't matter what kind of day you had, you're fighting with the kids and trying to get them out the door, but as soon as you step out of the car at church, the church smiles this one, hey, how's it going? On the inside, things are falling apart, but I'm not gonna show it out here, right? The church smile, especially on Easter, whatever you brought, real smile, church smile today, the message of Easter is that Jesus reached for me, and I'm glad of that. And he wants to meet you right where you are today, whether you got one of the big giant eggs because somebody invited you. God had a divine appointment in mind for you being here, being tuned in today. And I believe you're going to see it as you open yourself up to him. Some of us, I know we just met. I want to tell you, I've got three kids. My wife and I have been married 18 years. I've got a 13-year-old, 11-year-old, and a six-year-old. And I want to show you a picture of my six-year-old back when she was not even two just yet. Y'all say, aw. Ain't she cute? I mean, she just lights up the room. She runs around like she owns this place. If you ever see her, now you'll know. This is Kaya, and this is when Kaya was just learning to start walking, and she's reaching up for her daddy in this picture. And man, I love my babies. I love my kids. And so what do you, let me ask you, what do you think I did in this moment when she reached up for me? No, I went, get away from me, kid, go away. Of course I didn't do that. I reached down and I picked her up and I squeezed her and all her squishy little goodness. And man, we just had such a great moment because her daddy loves her so much. I love my kids. I can't even tell you how much I love my kids. But let me tell you something that blows your mind. As much as I love my kids as an earthly father in their life, it is nothing compared to how much your heavenly father loves you. He reaches for me at Easter. So here's the challenge. Follow Kaya's lead. Reach up to your heavenly father and watch as he reaches down right to where you are, no matter what you brought with you today. That, my friends, makes Christianity different than any other faith, any other religion, any other supposed path to God. People often ask me, what makes Christianity different? What sets Christianity apart from all of the other religions? I always come back to two things. One I just described to you, I would use the word grace. That's what makes Christianity different. Every other pathway to God, every other religion or approach to faith is gonna ultimately lead you back to some level of works-based faith. Here's what that means. It means I gotta measure up. I gotta be good enough to make a cut in order to make it into the family of God. But Jesus showed up and said, I got a different way. Instead of it being about religion, it's about relationship. You don't measure up. You can't measure up. Jesus says you can be saved by grace through faith, not of works, or then you would boast about it. It would be your work, but the truth is I bring nothing to the table. Isaiah says my righteousness is as filthy rags, but God... He gives me his grace. That's what makes Jesus so different. Second thing is what we're here to celebrate today is the resurrection. 
The reality is that the founder of every other religion, every other approach to faith will commemorate the founder of that religion. One of two things is true of that that founder. They're either commemorated and you're making pilgrimages to go commemorate or remember them because they're already in a tomb or they're headed to a tomb, but not Jesus. I took a group, Pastor Todd and I took a group to Israel this last year and this last summer, we went to one of the places where they believe very likely is the tomb of Jesus. And you know what I found there? Nothing. Because he is alive. And because he lives, I have hope. Today, the Christian church is the largest party of the resurrection that'll ever happen across the face of the earth. In AD 33, when the church of Jesus was beginning, there were about 120 followers of Jesus at the time. Now some 2,000 or so years later, there are estimated some 2.4 plus billion followers of Jesus out of the almost 8 billion people in the world. So how in the world does it go in 2,000 or so years from 120 to 2.5 billion? In a word, the resurrection, because he lives. Let's read about it together. You got your Bibles? Let's go to Luke chapter 24. That's where we're going to be today, Luke chapter 24, and we're going to start in verse 1. And I love that we're starting in verse 1 because I believe today could be a verse 1 kind of moment in your life where you're turning over a new page, where God's writing a new chapter in your story. That's what happened the day Jesus rose from the dead. That's why these, my friends, just got baptized As they went under the water, it symbolizes the death and burial of Jesus. And as they come out of the water, it's the resurrection of Jesus. I say, let's read about it, don't you? Give somebody a high five or fist bump if you're ready for the word today. This is what we do around here. We're ready to dig in. Verse number one, Luke 24. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus, While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, and as they were frightened, they bowed their faces to the ground, and the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered. Circle that word. We're going to come back there and live there a little bit today. He must be, he said, he must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And that he did. He is risen. The word delivered there, here it is in the Greek language, the original language that your scripture was written, we see it in English today, is paradidomai. Everybody say paradidomai. Use that at lunch today. You'll, they'll be real impressed. If you get it wrong, they won't even know anyway, right? Paradidomai. Here's what it means, and it has significance for the story of Jesus. File this away in your mind, and we'll bring it back in a few moments. It means handed over. It's this picture of, I have something that's mine. I hand it over, even for safekeeping for a certain time and certain season for certain reasons. It's handed over. Jesus said, I must be delivered. I must be handed over into the hands of sinful men, but I will rise. And when it comes to us as humans, rising from the dead feels very unnatural. Resurrection feels unnatural to us as humans. We would say death feels more natural. I can prove it to you. You drove by, if you came here onto the campus, you drove by a cemetery when you came in today. And you didn't think much about that. But let me tell you, if you drove by that cemetery and people started popping up out of the ground and coming to church with you, that would feel a little unnatural, right? Talk about an interesting resurrection Sunday. Death feels natural to us as humans and resurrection feels unnatural, but God does things in reverse. God goes counterintuitive to us. To God, death is what's unnatural, because he's a God of life. Resurrection is what's natural. That's who God is. He is light. He is life, and he's life to the fullest for us. Resurrection is who God is. It's not just a thing God did 2,000 years ago. Resurrection is who Jesus is. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And he wants you to have life in a way you've never had it before if you've never experienced him today. But here's what I know. I could preach that all day, man. I could get some some claps and cheers and we could say amen all day. But then I would ignore a couple of things I know about you. You may say, well, you don't know me. And you're right. We probably just met. But I do know two things about you. You're a human. And you, as of right now, have breath in your lungs. 
And as a human who has breath in our lungs, we know that God wants to meet us where we are. And I know that as long as we're a human that has breath in our lungs, sometimes we end up looking for all the right things, but looking for them in the wrong places. Can I get an amen? amen. You look for life. You look for hope, you look for peace, you look for purpose, you look for meaning. Those are good things. You look for the right things, but end up looking in all the wrong places. The angel said, why do you look for the living among the dead? We look for life in dead places. And I want to introduce you to two friends that were walking away from Jerusalem the same very day that Jesus rose from the dead. Continue in Luke 24, verse 13. We're going to meet two weary travelers who have been looking for the right things and maybe some of the wrong places. Go to verse 13. Let's meet them together. It says, that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus. It's about seven miles from Jerusalem. They're going away from where the Holy Spirit was going to come. Now, here's what happened. As they were talking, verse 14, to each other about all the things that had happened, while they were still talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. I love this story but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? Can you imagine the moment you're talking about Jesus and Jesus shows up, but you don't recognize it's Jesus and Jesus walks up to you and says, what y'all talking about? That's our story. And they stood still looking sad. Verse 18, then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was, they got that wrong, didn't they? A man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers, there's that word again, delivered, paradidomai, handed over him to be condemned to death and crucified him. Let's stop there for a moment. I'm going to give you today three ways Jesus reaches, things he reaches through. Number one comes from those verses, and it's that Jesus reaches through doubt. You got some of those, perhaps? I do. I've doubted a lot of things in my life. I've doubted Jesus. I've doubted me. I've doubted all the stuff. That's exactly the journey they were on. They're going the wrong way from where they're supposed to be. They're taking a detour because of their doubt. And what you need to know about this area, Emmaus, we don't even know on a map right now exactly where it was. Like it's so seemingly insignificant of a place that we've got guesses of where it might be, but we don't even know exactly where Emmaus was. And we only know the name of one of the two travelers. His name's Cleopas, but we don't know who else is with Cleopas. If it's his wife, if it's a friend, we don't know. So here's the thing. Jesus shows up and it says that he drew near to them, but Jesus didn't just draw near to them. We see that Jesus drew near to them and went with them. We don't serve a God who, when we have doubts, does like what, what, what I acted like I did to my daughter. Get away from me. No, he reaches you in your doubts, and he doesn't walk away. He walks along. We serve a God that even when we have doubts, he walks alongside us. He doesn't run away from us or tell us to go away. He walks with us. That's my God. And we're going to do a series on doubt, by the way, starting next Sunday. Y'all should come. We're going to call it deconstructing doubt because we believe at Midway Church that the church of Jesus, not because it's our idea, but because of passages like this that show us who Jesus is, that we should meet people where they are. That's what Jesus did and embrace the doubts and the questions and give you a safe place to wrestle through what it is you're wrestling through. This is who Jesus is. It's what he's doing on the road to Emmaus. So he walks along. He draws near to them. But let me ask you, if you were Jesus... On the day you defeated death, because listen, the resurrection of Jesus is the death of death. Because he rose from the dead, death will be no more one day. Grief will be no more one day. We'll be with him forever as a part of his family if we surrender our life to him. What an amazing accomplishment. On the day you gave death a TKO, a total knockout, what would you do? Now, if he had, Jesus had a PR person, they'd say, well, go to the most significant places, right? 
Go to get the biggest microphone. Go to the most significant people. But Jesus instead goes to two people who seem like they are so insignificant, we don't even know their name in scripture. I love that because it reminds me that when I feel insignificant, I'm the kind of person Jesus comes to. Jesus goes with them the wrong way to a seemingly insignificant location and with insignificant people. That's what Jesus did on the day he defeated death. He walked with them in their doubt. He reaches through our doubt. Listen, my friend, this God who holds all power in the whole universe, the King of Kings, he's also personal. I can think of so many times where God's shown me he's personal. I've doubted myself. You, don't, you may not know my story. I'm not supposed to be a preacher, you guys. I was a shy kid, couldn't talk in front of anybody to save my life. And God, and these things, like, nah. -uh. Can I get an amen? Some of y'all are with me. Don't tell God. Listen, I'm gonna give y'all some advice. Don't tell God you'll never be something because that's what I did, and now I'm a preacher. That one thing I said I'd never be. I was a PK, grew up. I was around all the answers, but man, I questioned faith, and I went on this doubt journey, and my dad, who was a pastor, even bought me books that weren't along the lines of Christianity. I studied other religions and passed to God, and he said, your only prerequisite, I'll buy you the books as long as you will just tell me what God's showing you as you seek him. That's the kind of dad I had. But man, I can remember one moment I was so depressed. I got shingles on my right eye when I was 21 years old. I was working myself to death. I had five different jobs and roles. And I, listen, the, I was doing the work of God, but the way I was doing the work of God was destroying the work of God in me. Christians, did you know that can happen to you? You can look like you got the church smile and you got it all together, but on the inside, everything's just gonna be falling apart sometimes. And that was me, and I was depressed. But my earthly father just sat with me. You know what? No big words. He didn't preach me a sermon. He just sat with me. He was just personal. And because I had a personal, because I had a pers personal earthly father, I saw my heavenly father reach for me in the depths of my doubts and despair. I doubted him. I doubted me. But God reached for me in my doubts. He wants to do the same for you. He did the same for these people on the journey to Emmaus, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Verse 16, I wanna ask you, friends, what in your life is causing you to not recognize or be able to see the presence of God in your life? I believe that just like Jesus was walking right alongside them, but they didn't recognize him, I think, listen, you're, one day you're gonna look back and you're gonna see moments just like this last week when you were ready to give up and you're gonna say, he was with me the whole time. Who knew? You're gonna look back and see it. So what is it that the enemy is using to keep you from recognizing the presence of God in your life? And listen, I love the Bible, you guys. I love what happens next in this story. I love the word of God. If you think the Bible's boring, I think you're boring. You should read it. And if I insulted you good enough to wake you up enough, let's keep going now, because let me tell you why I think it's not boring. It shows humor, it shows humanity, because listen to what they start doing as you go towards verse 20. These people are telling Jesus about Jesus. That's funny, y'all, I don't care where you come from. And Jesus just listens, and he's patient. They, listen, they're talking to the great I am. And they begin their statement with, he was. <laughs> That's the wrong way to do it. He was a prophet. He was. Maybe you feel like God is a he was. I came to tell you today, he'll reach you in those doubts and remind you that he's the great I am today. Jesus reaches through doubt. Let's keep going. Verse 21, I'll show you another thing Jesus reaches through. Verse 21 says, but we had hoped. Pause. Man, those verse, that verse will preach, won't it? Do you have any had-hoped moments in your life? You had hope the cancer would be gone. You had hope that your marriage wouldn't have fallen apart. You had hope that you could have mended that relationship. You had hope that you would be in a different place in this season of your life. You had hoped. I could keep going, but do you have any had-hoped moments? They sure did. We had hope, they said, verse 21, that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some of the women of our company, they amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels and who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him, they did not see. I didn't either when I was there. Verse 25, and he said to them, oh foolish ones, Jesus is talking now, and slow of heart to believe what all the prophets have spoken. 
Was, not, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures. Man, I wish I could have been a fly on the wall of that conversation. He interpreted to them all the scriptures, the things concerning who? Himself. Did you know that Jesus is the point of every book of the Bible? All 66 books point to one theme, one person, one resurrected Savior, the resurrection of Jesus, without which our faith would be in vain. My preaching would be in vain. Jesus is the theme of every book of the Bible, and he showed them that. But they're still feeling stuck. Look at verse 28, 29. It says, so they drew near to the village where they were going. He acted as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly saying, stay with us. For it is toward evening, and day, the day is now far spent. So what did Jesus do? Well, so he went in to stay with them. He didn't kick them over and say, go away from me, child. He reached down and said, I'll stay with you. Aren't you glad you have a God who will stay with you and you've been in your dead ends? Because now, listen, doubt has become discouragement, and discouragement has become despair. That's number two. Jesus reaches through despair. Jesus reaches through our doubt to meet us. Jesus reaches through despair to meet us. Now, doubt has led to discouragement. Discouragement has led them on a detour. They're going the wrong way. Now, their discouragement has turned into despair and agony, and it's led them to a dead end. They're at Emmaus. That's not where they're supposed to be. That's not where the Holy Spirit was going to come. That's not the next step of their faith. But in their doubt and in their despair, they went on a detour. Now they're at a dead end. And I came to tell somebody today that's stuck. Some of you are stuck. You've been looking at what was, knowing that, man, I can't get to what God has for me. You feel stuck in a dead end, that God will meet you in your dead ends. They had hope. They had hope. So I want to challenge you today to write this down and live this out. Don't miss what can be because you are stuck in what was. Our God is a what's next kind of God. Our God is a bring life to death kind of God. Our God is a God that leads you to a next step. Our God is a God of making all things new. It's kind of like a windshield in your car. When you drove here today, Hopefully, you didn't drive the whole way to church looking and staring at your rearview mirror. Now, there's a, some of you, I've listened, I've seen some people drive, and I'm not sure they don't stare at their rearview mirror the whole time. <laughs> don't elbow them if they're here, right? They already know. But just like, listen, it's there for glancing. I need to know what's back there, but if I'm driving a car, I'm looking through the windshield or I'm going to have a wreck. The, listen, if we wouldn't drive a car staring at the rearview mirror, why would we drive the journey and the life of faith that God has called us to staring at the rearview mirror? Some of us are stuck in what was, and because we're stuck in what was, we can't see what God wants to make happen. We can't see what could be. We can't see the new God wants to do in you. Our God is a what's next kind of God. Resurrection helps me look at today's problems from tomorrow's perspective. When I know where God's taken me, I know, listen, I've read the end. Y'all read the end? Again, if you think it's boring, you should read it. Read to the end. You know who wins? Jesus wins. In fact, you know what happened? Jesus already won. I'll show you that in just a few minutes. And because he lives, because he won, I can be on the winning team in the end. And when I know that is my destination, then the journey to get there, I can make sure I don't stare at that rearview mirror and I drive forward in my walk and journey of faith. Jesus meets me in my despair and reminds me that there's still a windshield. Look at me for a minute, friends. I want to tell y'all something there is still a windshield for you. God is not done with you yet. There's breath in your lungs. You keep trusting him. You watch him meet you in your despair. This is why we have what we're calling a discipleship pathway. Our Midway fam that's been around a while, you know we've been working on this for a year. And it's online right now, and I invite you, it's free. It's a discipleship pathway that has three steps to encounter Jesus, live like Jesus, and lead like Jesus. The circular, because then you help others do that in your life. You go to midwaychurch.com, click the big button that says discipleship pathway. You can sign up for free today. It's launched today. And it's, why do we have that? Because we believe there's always a next step, because God's a windshield kind of God. But yet we feel stuck. Sin makes us feel stuck. Habits make us feel stuck. Sin will always make you pay way more than you ever intended to pay, make you stay longer than you ever intended 
to stay. It'll make you go further than you ever intended to go. And sometimes it leads you to this place where you're stuck in sin and you feel like you're just in that place of despair. He reaches through doubt. He reaches through despair. Let's see what else he reaches through. What lengths will this Jesus go to to reach me? Let's, by the way, these next verses, my favorite verses in the whole chapter. Here they are. Verse 30. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave, y'all circle that word, and gave it to them. Verse 31, and their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road and while he opened to us the scriptures. Verse 33, and they rose that same hour. They did a U-turn. This is what I'm praying for over some of us today. And they returned to Jerusalem. They found the 11 and those that were gathered there together saying, the Lord has risen indeed. And he has appeared to Simon. And they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Number three, my friends, what does Jesus reach through? Yes, your doubt. Yes, it's your despair. It's even your detours and dead ends. But number three, Jesus will even reach through death. Romans 3.23 says that all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Sin is missing the mark. God has a perfect standard. He's holy. We're not. Isaiah tells us our righteousness is as filthy rags. That's why grace comes in. I sure am glad that's not the end of my story. I can't be good enough. But Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages, the price, the consequence, the cost of our sin and not measuring up, missing the mark, of what God's called me to is what? Death, the wages of sin is, say it with me, death. But Jesus, but God, reached through death to bring me life. He reached through my doubt, he reached through my despair, and now he reaches out to give them this bread, give. That word give in verse 30, comes from the same roots, the same language. You remember paradidomai I told you about earlier? Hand it over, same kind of words. I wanna show you how much this word, paradidomai, hand it over. Here we are again. It played a big role in the descriptions in the gospels about Jesus and his journey to the cross. Let me show you four ways that you see this word. Here they are. Judas, you remember when Judas betrayed Jesus? In Mark 14 and verse 10, it's paradidomai. Judas, it says betrayed Jesus. It was translated betrayed, but it's paradidomai. He handed it over Jesus to the chief priest. In Mark 15, verse 1, this word is delivered, but the chief priest delivered or handed over Jesus to Pilate. And then Pilate eventually handed over, delivered, paradidomai, handed over Jesus to be crucified. As they said, crucify him. He said, well, all right, I don't find fault, but if that's what you want, he handed him over. This is the most important part. Jesus, paradidomai, handed over his spirit from the cross. John 19, verse 30. Let's look at it together. John 19, 30 says, when he had received this sour wine, three things happened. He said, it is finished. And it wasn't a cry of defeat. It was a cry of victory. To tell us die. Paid in full. It's complete. And then he bowed his head. It looks like he bowed his head in defeat and in agony. But no, this is the same language, the same word that Jesus used when he said, foxes have their holes. Birds of the air have their nest, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Lay his head. It's the same language. It's a language of rest. Jesus is saying, because it is finished, because I've completed the task that God gave me to do, I've taken this place of violence and I've turned it into a place of rest. And man, that's good. That'll preach, won't it? But that's not even my favorite part because then it says, paradidomai, that Jesus gave up his spirit. You're saying, pastor, why are you telling me all of these things? I'm telling you these things to tell you that nobody took Jesus' life from him. He gave it up willingly. He gave it freely for you and for me. He gave. Here's how Jesus said it. John 10, 18. He said, no one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily. I have the authority to lay it down when I want and also to take it up again for this is what my father commanded. Listen, it looked like the life of Jesus was in the hands of Judas. It looked like the life of Jesus was in the hands of Pilate. It looked like the life of Jesus was in the hands of the chief priest. It looked like Satan had in his hands the life of Jesus, but God had it in his hands the whole time. He just handed it over for a moment for three days later. 
later, he was going to take it back the whole time, that which belonged to him to begin with, because he's king of kings and he's Lord of lords. What looked like an end was a beginning. What looked like death was life. What looked like a removal of the life of Jesus was actually him reaching out for God so loved the world that he gave. He handed over his life. Back to our story. Jesus gave them the bread. He gave them the bread. And when he gave them the bread, their eyes were opened. You wonder, what did they see then that they didn't see before? Well, you know, they were starting to think things like this. Wait a minute, all seven miles of doubt? All seven miles of despair? This walk of death that I've been on, on this road to Emmaus, Jesus was there the whole time. And in your life and in your journey, I believe today's gonna be a day where you look back in all the doubt and despair and you say, Jesus was there the whole time, reaching for me right where I was. They said our hearts, didn't our hearts just burn within us? Some of you, you got heartburn right now <laughs> and it ain't indigestion. Your heart is burning within you, just like theirs did. I want to show you what Jesus did. He handed over his life. Three ways he showed us that. He stretched out his arms. Your kids ever say, how much do you love me this much? Jesus said, I love you this much. He stretched out his arms, and they nailed him to a cross. This is how he reached for you. Then Thomas would come along. How many doubting Thomases in the house? I raised my hand because that's me. I got doubts. Maybe you got doubts. He saw the disciples, and he said, well, I heard you saw Jesus, but I hadn't seen him. And until I touched the scars on his hands... I won't believe. So what do you think Jesus did? He went, get away from me, Thomas. I'm tired of you. No, no. He shows up again to Thomas, just for Thomas, and says, Thomas, look, he reached. He gave. He said, see the scar? By the way, you ever, if I was Jesus, I would have gotten rid of the scars. Like, I don't want to look at all that. It reminds me of the pain. But Jesus kept his scars. You ever thought about that? It's because he brings beauty from ashes. It's because he redeems pain. And he wanted to use his scars to reach Thomas. And he put his hand on his side and say, Phil, right here. I want to reach you right where you're at. And the same thing happened here. Verse 35 says that Jesus was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Now, it doesn't say exactly what they saw then that they didn't see now. But here's how I would imagine it going. Something like this. He took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them. And you wonder if they didn't see the scar when he gave them the bread. And their eyes were open, and he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Friends, today, Jesus handed over his life, and he looked at Satan, who held the keys to death, hell, and the grave. And he said, Satan, you thought you had won, but hand over the keys. I'm still Lord. He rose from the dead, and he won the victory you could never win. He paid the price for your sin that you could never pay. He's king of kings. He's Lord of lords. So here's the question. Why would you still keep carrying that which Jesus already carried to the cross and nailed it there? I want to ask you to bow your heads and ponder that. And for these next few minutes, I want to ask you, nobody move. We have time. And I want to pray for some specific groups of people in this moment right now. So I want to ask you to be honest with God for these next several moments. First of all, as you reach out to God, he'll reach to you. There are some in the room that you know you're saved. You just know that you know that you know. Some of you won't be able to raise your hand to this question. And if so, that's, if that's you, I want to speak to you in just a moment. If that's you right now, but you would say, I know that I'm saved. I'm totally confident. Would you lift your hand up right now? Awesome. I think it's amazing. You can put your hands down. Now I want to talk to three groups of you. Some of you couldn't raise your hand, and I'm going to talk to you specifically in just a moment. But I want to talk to three groups of you, and in a few moments, I'm going to ask some of you to be bold. Just as Jesus was bold and went to the cross publicly, I want to ask you to let me pray over you in just a moment. We're going to stand here. This is just a wood platform. There's nothing special about this, but we're going to turn it into an altar on this Easter Sunday. First group of people I want to talk to right now, you're saved. You know you've given your life to Jesus, but man, you're stuck. You're just stuck in something. You know something's not where it's supposed to be. I know I'm saved, but I went on a detour, and I feel like I'm kind of at a dead-end moment. I'm stuck in some hurt, habit, hang-up, some sin, some addiction, or maybe just doubt or despair. I'm stuck in what was, and I'm not moving forward. If that's you right now, would you just lift your hand? I want to pray for you specifically all over the house. I see you. I see you. 
God sees. You lift your hand if I can't see you online. Now, you can put your hands down. Here's what I'm going to ask you. If you just raise your hand in a moment, I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to say amen. I'm going to count to three. When I get to three, you're a believer, but you feel stuck. I want to ask you to be the first people to come meet me here and stand down front when we stand in just a moment. That's my request of you. Second group of people, you would say, I know I'm saved, but as I've seen baptisms today, I know I've never been baptized. Jesus asked me to do that. Jesus did that himself. If that's you right now, you would say, I'm saved, but man, I, I need to talk to somebody about baptism. Or I just want you to pray for me, Pastor, because I think that may be my next step. Would you lift your hand? I see you, I see you. Lift it high. I'm gonna ask you to come and join those in just a moment. I'm just gonna pray for you and give you some next steps. Last but not least, you can put all hands down third group of people, you couldn't raise your hand earlier saying, I know that I'm saved and I know that if I died today, I would spend eternity with God in heaven. If that's you today, listen, all I want to do is have the opportunity to pray for you. And I want to give you some next steps and give you an opportunity to take a step. I can't do anything for you, but Jesus is ready to do everything for you. If that is you, you're just not sure, but you would say, pastor, just pray for me today. I'm just not sure, but I, I would really like to be. If that's you, would you lift your hand right now? Be bold. I see you. I see you. All over the room, I see hands. I'm gonna ask you in just a moment to come and join me as I pray, all right? I'm gonna pray for us. I wanna ask you, will you stand to your feet for just a moment? Eyes closed, heads bowed. I'm gonna pray. And as soon as I say amen, I'm gonna ask all three of those groups of people just to come stand here. It's gonna be crowded. There are gonna be a lot of people and we got time. Let me pray for us. God, thank you for the boldness of next steps. And Lord, as we have this moment, I pray right now that Lord, you would do what only you can do. You would meet people where they are. We thank you. We praise you. We give you honor. We thank you for your boldness in going to the cross. And I pray for boldness now for people to step out in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. All right, you ready? One, two, three. Come this way. If you're one of those three groups, just step on out. Be bold as Jesus was bold. We're going to wait on you. Come stand in here. Fill it in. It's going to be busy. There's going to be lots of people. Y'all crowd on in this way. We'll crowd in. We're going to wait on you. Y'all give us some encouragement. This is boldness. Jesus was bold. Jesus had courage. My friends here have courage. Whether you're stuck in something, you need to be baptized, you're ready to give your life to Christ, come forward right now. We'll wait on you in this moment. Y'all come on in. Fill it in here. Come on in. I just want to pray over you. Y'all give us some encouragement one more time as people are still coming. We're going to wait for you if you're in the back. And as I'm talking, if you still want to come, you come. I'm going to pray for you right now. Friends, let me have your eyes for just a second. I want to tell you, I'm so proud of you. God sees you right where you're at. I see the brokenness. I see the pain. But I see a God who's ready to break chains. I see a God who's ready to set you free. And I want to pray over all of you right now. I don't know if you're here because you're stuck in something, because you need to be baptized, or you're ready to receive Christ, or you're just trying to figure that out. I'm going to pray for you. Let me start with those of you who feel stuck. Let's pray together right now. God, I pray for those who are standing here, who are bold enough to come, and even those who can't, who are tuned in online and in the house but just didn't come. Maybe they'll come right now. But God, I pray in the name of Jesus that chains will break. I pray in the name of Jesus that you'll reach into their doubt. You'll reach into their detours. You'll reach into their despair. You'll reach even into life itself, God, through death to bring them life, that you'll break the chains of bondage, that, Lord, you will show them that what makes them feel stuck is but a footstool for you because you're on the throne. And God, I pray that whatever Satan's using for evil in their life, you would turn it around and redeem it and use it for good. In Jesus' name, I pray over my friends. And with our heads bowed, our eyes closed, how many of you are here? You're here because you know I need to be baptized. And that's why you raise your hand. If you will, just look at me if that's you for a moment. I see you. I'm proud of you guys. I see you. I see you. I see you. I'm going to pray over you. God, thank you for those that just looked up at me. Those that said, my next step is baptism. We've seen it exemplified and modeled here today. God, I praise your name. I pray you give them the boldness of Jesus in their life. Lord, to take that big step. Meet them where they're at, God. Thank you. And last but not least, if you're here today and you're just saying, Pastor, I just want you to pray for me. I'm just not sure if I've really surrendered my life. Would you look at me for a moment? Just look up at me. I see you. I see you. God sees you. God sees you, and he's ready to meet you where you are. It's your journey. I'm going to kneel right here and pray over you. Right eye level with you because I'm right there with you. I can do none of this apart from Jesus. So God, I pray over them right now. Would you give them boldness to trust you? And if you're ready to take that step today, friend, I can't save you, but Jesus is ready. If you're ready to take that step right now, pray something like this. A prayer won't save you, 
but a surrender of your heart. I wanna say to you, hand it over. Jesus handed over his life, hand it over, surrender right now. Say, Jesus, today I'm yours. I know you died for me. I know you rose from the dead. I'm handing over my life right now. Will you save me and forgive me? I turn around and I run to you. Thank you for reaching me. Thank you for saving me. If that's you right now, the heavens are rejoicing, friends. I wanna ask all of you just to look at me for a moment. If you've come down front, God sees you where you're at. If you took a next step today, we wanna to celebrate with you. God and the heavens are rejoicing. And what you're gonna find is, you see these cards out here? I wanna challenge you. Would y'all come on forward and just grab one of these cards? Just grab it right now. Just go ahead and take one and take it back to your seat in just a moment. Here's what I wanna tell you. As you go back to your seat, fill out that card and there are gonna be people to my left and your right. They just love to pray over you or you can just drop off the card. Make sure you get one before you leave here. There's plenty here. There's even some pens. Take it back to your seat, fill it out and we wanna walk with you. I wanna ask you, fill it out. Let us know how we can serve you. But right now, as you get these cards and go to your seat, we wanna celebrate your life and these next steps and the victory only Jesus can win. Can we celebrate them, friends? Grab these cards, head back to your seats and then make sure you turn them in. Let's give God some praise. Thank you for his word. He reaches. He's reaching you. Yes, he does. And all God's people said, amen. Let's give God some praise in this place. Thank him for new life. He brings life to death. Listen, if you filled out one of those cards, you've got one, fill it out, drop it off. We wanna walk with you. You can do the same thing online. There's a link in the description of the video you're watching. There's people in the chat ready to chat with you. I wanna thank you for coming. And I want you to know he 